Okay, this is the influence of the Spanish conquistadors in the New World Part 2 about the conquest of Mexico. And here we pick up where we left off with uh, the Cortez expedition that started in Cuba, went across the Caribbean in 1519 around the Yucatan Peninsula, Peninsula and eventually made its way into modern-day Mexico City in 1521, where Cortez led the conquest of the Aztecs. Now we want to spend a little bit more time with this because the Aztecs were one of the greatest empires in world history, and their downfall is a tragic story. Now, while Cortez is famous for the conquest of the Aztecs, he could not have pulled that off without the help of someone who, frankly, is not very well known outside of Mexico, but was exceptionally valuable to what Cortez was trying to do. Her name was Malinche, and she was a Spanish castaway who had been slaved by another major tribal group in Mexico, the Mayans, and eventually was picked up by Cortez and rescued from them. Now, she knew the language of the Aztecs, so Cortez had a tremendous advantage. Once he came across the Aztecs, he could speak the language of the Aztecs, but also know what they were saying if they tried to speak other languages in front of him, trying to keep secrets away from him while he was standing right there. Malinche could uh, interpret uh, what the Aztecs were saying and also interpret many other languages from the region. It was a tremendous advantage. She was so important to Cortez that eventually she was baptized with a Spanish name, Dona Marina, and is considered one of the most influential figures in the Spanish history of conquest in modern-day Mexico. But what led Cortez to the Aztecs in the first place? Well, as you can imagine, it was gold. He had heard about gold at the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan which is located in central Mexico and is today known as Mexico City. Cortez's expedition, like we said before, in 1519 took him around the Yucatan Peninsula and eventually led to him landing at Veracruz in fairly short order. The remaining voyage would take quite a bit longer and the conquering of the Aztecs would take a full two years. But to make sure that his men knew that they were committed to the cause, whether they wanted to be or not, when he landed at Veracruz, he burned his ships to motivate his men. In other words, he was telling them, there is no retreat. We either conquer the Aztecs or we die. I guess that will motivate you. Eventually, Cortes would meet the Aztec leader, Montezuma, at Tenochtitlan, but it wasn't under attacking circumstances at first. When the Spanish arrived, they were completely stunned by the sight of the city. It was much greater than anything they had anticipated or imagined, and frankly, much more culturally advanced than they expected. Tenochtitlan had 300,000 inhabitants spread over 10 square miles on an island in the center of a lake, surrounded by floating gardens. It was also connected to the mainland by a series of causeways that had taken quite a bit of engineering and expertise to build. The central part here that you see is the city of Tenochtitlan itself, located in the middle of a lake. And it was supplied with fresh water by a very extravagant aqueduct. Overall, the city was extremely advanced for its time. Now, to Cortez's surprise, the Aztecs initially welcomed him as a god. He hadn't expected that, but he was going to take full advantage of it as he could. Why did the Aztecs do this? Well, the answer was in Cortez's appearance. They had never seen the shining armor that the Spaniards were wearing, and that they had never come across anything like that in their history or their culture or anything else. It glistened in the sun, was unfamiliar to them, and the Spaniards were coming in on horses, which the Aztecs had never seen before either. When they saw these things for the first time, it made the Spanish soldiers, particularly Cortes, seem very otherworldly and godlike. And as a result, they gave Cortes fabulous gifts. Now, all this did was make Cortes more greedy, and soon he started asking about the gold that he had heard about and demanding that as gifts. 
Now, while the Spaniards were being presented to the people of Tenochtitlan as gods, uh, Montezuma, the leader, was starting to get apprehensive about the whole thing. Eventually, he became suspicious and inhospitable due to Cortez's greediness. Cortez just had this lust for gold and power and kept asking for more gold and trying to take power away as the god of the city, the god of the Aztecs. Uh, Montezuma got to the point where he wasn't buying it, and that eventually led to problems between the, the Spaniards and the Aztecs. The result was Noche Triste in 1520, when the Aztecs attempted to drive the Spaniards out of the city. Cortez, as a, as a result, put the city under siege, and the Aztecs couldn't hold up. They would eventually surrender in 1521, and Noche Triste would wipe out 300 years of Aztec culture in the process. The Spaniards had conquered the city. And the changes to Mexican culture wouldn't necessarily be positive. The first noticeable change was the advent of smallpox, which is a disease that starts as very small blisters and progressively gets worse and worse until it completely overtakes your body. The smallpox ep epidemic would eventually affect the Aztecs in horrific fashion, as you can see from this little boy right here, this is what smallpox looks like. Eventually, smallpox would almost wipe out the Aztec population, which would drop from 20 million to 2 million in less than 100 years. Aztec temples would soon be destroyed to make room for Christian cathedrals. Tenochtitlan would be ruined. Uh, temples would fall, and eventually it would become known as Mexico City. And as you can see here, Mexico City in the modern day doesn't really reflect any of the remnants of the once great city of the Aztecs. Within the next 50 years after the conquest of the Aztecs, there would be hundreds of Spanish cities and towns popping up all over modern day Mexico, and in regions around Mexico as well, such as Rio de Janeiro. Eventually, European crops, animals, language, printing presses, laws, customs, and religions became the new Latin American culture, specifically in Mexico, including distinguished universities at Mexico City and in Lima, Peru, both of which were established in 1551, 85 years before Harvard. Approximately 160,000 Spaniards would eventually subjugate millions of Native Americans into slavery, and the changes to Mexican culture brought about by European conquest would lead to an entirely new ethnic group as well. As more Europeans moved into the region and either married or simply had children with the Native American Mexicans that were there, it brought about a new ethnic group called Mestizo, which is a mix of Mexican and European heritage. As a result of all these changes to Mexican culture, Mexican civilization to this day remains a unique mix of pride and also antagonism toward the European conquistadors and what they did there. For example, remember Malinche? Well, her name is now part of the word Malinchista, which is the Mexican word for traitor. However, Mexicans also celebrate Columbus Day as Dia de la Raza. They refer to that as the birth of a new people. So, on one hand, they are antagonistic towards some of their history, but yet they celebrate the European heritage and other parts of their history. Very unique. To many, the changes to Mexican culture brought about by the Spanish conquistadors are simply referred to as the Black Legend. And the Black Legend basically says that the conquistadors tortured and butchered the Native Americans in Mexico, stole their gold, and infected them. All of which is true. But it's also debated by some of those in Mexico itself who say that it's only half the story, pointing out the culture that was created as a result of the, of the conquistador expeditions. So, uh, is what happened in Mexico a black legend? Or is it uh, actually a positive in modern Mexican society? Well, that's up to each of us to decide for ourselves. Okay, that's it. Thanks for listening.